Hi, everybody. Welcome to our program. Think back. It doesn't take really very much because the memory of the scandal is still fresh in everyone's mind. There she is, Sydney Biddlebarrows, arrested for running a high-class escort service, which was called Cache. And because of her pilgrim ancestors, she is promptly labeled the Mayflower Madam, kind of a classy-looking woman. Well, she's with us today, and she's going to be telling us about her five and a half secret years running that call girl service and her new autobiography. So that'll be a lot of fun. Also with us on today's program is this woman who's been here before, Tony Tucci. She is the author of a book called The Butterfly Secret. She has been the other woman in relationships. Tony, how do you feel about the uh, kind of services that were provided by Sydney Biddle Barrows through her call girl service? Bill, I'm a traditional woman, and in my time, at my period of life, uh, we knew about the oldest profession in the world, and our mothers told us to accept it. Frankly, I like the idea of the escort service better than that. Okay. Also on today's program, you're going to meet Karen O'Neill. She's from New York Magazine. There you see it. She's going to be talking about the use of personal ads and uh, how they're getting people together these days. Also on our show, one of the authors of this book, Gloria Jacobs, co-author of Remaking Love, which examines the effects of 20 years of the sexual revolution on women. Also, a woman who's been with us before, this is Abby Hirsch. She is the founder of Godmothers, which is a dating service for, quote, a select few. What we want to know is this, Abby, isn't that kind of dating service for a select few really just another very subtle way of getting people together for sex? I don't think so. People who come to us come to us for love, not sex, because as we've discussed many times, sex is really all around, and after sex, people still need relationships. Okay, well, we're going to be talking a lot about sex on today's show, and obviously one of the things we're going to be talking about is how much the current paranoia and justified paranoia about AIDS is affecting the kind of business that happens through call girl services and classified ads and, and uh, magazines and so forth. So I don't want you to leave. This should be an interesting interview. Sydney Biddle Barrows, five and a half years, a totally secret life, a society type woman, classy woman running an escort service with 30 women going out on calls, turning tricks about three nights a week, made a lot of money. We'll find out how she did it right after this. Don't leave. Welcome, and here's a woman we've all heard a great deal about, Sydney Biddle Barrows, the Mayflower Madam, called the Mayflower Madam because of her heritage and because she was arrested a few years back for running basically a call girl service. Welcome to our show. You've written a book which is called Mayflower Madam. You're not afraid to use the title. Why not? And it's basically an autobiography with a ghostwriter. Actually, he's not a ghost, William Novak, who wrote Iacocca. First thing I want to do is establish what this business was, was like that you ran, the call girl service called Cachet. It was not a brothel. It Men not. did not come to your place, and there was no sex on the premise. Explain what it was. Okay, what I ran was technically called an out-call service. In other words, the gentleman would call up, would give us an idea of the type of young lady he was looking for. We would make every effort to match him up with somebody that uh, was like that. You had about 30 women working for you, right? Uh, no, no, no. That's, that's a misconception. On every night, there would be anywhere between, say, 6 and 10, or on a busy, during the busy season, between, say, 10 and 15. What was the busy season? The busy season was September through the middle of December. Why? I have no idea. One of the reasons, I think, is because the UN General Assembly opened. I know why. Lot, why? Autumn in New York. The song says it brings the promise of new love. Oh, is that That's what it, it is? Yeah. Well, actually, I don't think many of, my, and many of my clients were really looking for love. Um, was well, you write about love some, in all the wrong places? <laughs> but you do write about some of them actually falling in, in love or beginning to fall in love with the women. And then those women had to conveniently be moved or yes, pretend they left true. town. So the service worked that a man would call pretty much during the day. No, no, he would. They would pretty much call right about when they wanted somebody. Although quite a number of our out-of-town clients were very, very organized, and they would call as much as a week ahead of time and say, you know, I'm going to be in town on such and such a date, and uh, either they had someone specific that they wanted to see or they asked who was available, and this way we would make sure that that girl would be available for them for that evening. I think really, when I was thinking about what's the big question that people have about Sydney Biddle Barrows, there are a couple. One is whether or not you yourself ever uh, answered any of the calls, or you yourself ever were paid for being an escort with a man. We know everybody always assumes that no one would be a madam who hadn't been an escort first or a call girl first, whichever you'd like to call it. And that's just simply not true. I think what most people don't realize is that the vast majority of businesses like mine are run by men. And nobody ever, you know, asks them if they've worked their way up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I really never had that much of an opportunity to work. I personally, I think do, working in this business is a very personal moral choice. And that just was not a choice I chose to make. 
Um, my skills lay in the management end of the business. You're in the management, so we know you actually do say in the book that uh, you're rather traditional in your values of sex. So you will say uncategorically that you yourself never personally were paid for services like this. Okay. All right, now, when the police busted you, what were the charges against you? Uh, promoting prostitution. And it's a Class B felony, which is the same as uh, murder, manslaughter. And, and now, I'm in reading from your book, and I, I read the whole book, and I want to say, if somebody wants to read a, uh, a good story, I think, I think this is well put together. You had something here when you were talking about what the, the charges against you. On page 60, you say, According to the letter of the law, prostitution does not occur merely because sex takes place and money changes hands. It's only prostitution if the client is actually paying for sex. The question then is whether we intended to sell sex for money, and we claim that I did not. Now, right. all right, that's, so that was your, that's what you said that you weren't doing. But then on page 154 and 155, you say, for the unmarried man who could afford to call us, we offered the object of every man's fantasy the sure thing, right? With a girl from cachet, there would be no whining, no feminist rhetoric, no expressions of concern about commitment or biological clock. She would not be trying to impress him or check him out as a possibility. You go on to say, quote, the client also knew that there would be no struggles over sex, that he would go to bed with her with no guilt and with no strings. And if you were selling the service that you just described, isn't that really ultimately selling sex? Well, you know, well, I think what we were doing is breaking the spirit of the law. We were not technically breaking the law. When they say that breaking the law is, is sex for money, that would mean that in the hours that the young lady was there that no sex took place, the client would pay X amount of money. But then when he did have sex, then he would pay more money. That would be selling sex. We charged our clients $175 an hour for every hour the young lady was there, no matter what did or did not take place. He didn't pay less if he didn't do anything, and he didn't pay more if he did. Uh, yes, there was an expectation of sex, but it was not, it was not, uh, he, it was not for money. It's hard to explain. I, it, as I said, in the spirit of the law, we broke it. Technically, we did not. And that's how you were able to defend right, yourself through that technicality. Right. One of the things I found interesting about the book was, because I guess of your basic interest in what was going on and your needs to keep records about what the mm -hmm. men were like, what their preferences were, uh, you learned a tremendous amount about the kind of fantasies I think that men have. and and how you could you know, make a profit uh, along the way of doing this. It, it, let's talk about some of the things that you found that men really preferred. One was something which you called playing bridge. Tell us how that evolved and how you worked that out. Okay. One thing I would like to make very, very clear before we start this out is that I never made any extra money from uh, any of these things. The girls, the clients paid for, you know, X number of dollars an hour, of which I got 75. Which was about, what, $175 an hour? Yes, and the girls got 100 and I got 75. And when the girls played bridge, which was our way of saying two young ladies with one gentleman, uh, the client had to pay each girl an extra $50 each because when I hired her, I hired her with the expectation of her being with one person. And if she so chose to also be with a second person, I felt that she ought to be compensated for it. So the extra $50 the client would pay to each girl was kept totally by them. Mm -hmm. And the reason we call it playing bridge was because just in case our phones were being tapped, and at one point they were, illegally I might add, um, we wanted to be able to have a code word over the phone that we would know we needed to send another person without specifically saying what it was for. So to send a, uh, a second party to play bridge, you know, to round out. So then you had your nice little menage a trois. Also, it was interesting that you had some clients who would actually hire five girls for an hour. Isn't that amazing? Just basically to sit around the room in their underwear and drink and champagne. Drink champagne and talk to them. We had more of those people than you could ever imagine. And they would keep the girls for hours and hours and hours. We had one man who's A lot of profit in there. Oh. It was just an incredible, I couldn't believe the kind of money. You were about to say about one man? One man uh, always, ne never kept a girl for less than eight hours, and he usually had anywhere between one and four. Mm. He would do this all the time. The night we were busted, the night before we were busted, we had one man who just written us a check for $3,000, which I regrettably never got a chance to cash. And uh, he had had three girls over there. He also kept records about the actual size of of the men if they had a particularly large uh, Well, if they were organ. very large. Uh, Why did you do that? Because a lot of our girls were very small. 
and they simply could not accommodate somebody like of the men if they had a particularly large uh, well if they male were organ. very large uh, why did you do that because a lot of our girls were very small and they simply could not accommodate somebody like that so that we would not inadvertently send these girls to someone like that uh, we just made a note what constituted large I mean in other I words, have no idea I was not well there. I mean, no but what I meant was it, it, you actually marked in their card uh, first, it was BD, but right. then you changed that to LP. To LP. Uh, I mean, ba basically, what was an LP? I guess it was just one that was larger than they was used to seeing. But never, nobody ever got into actual measurement no, zones, anything of like not. that. No. How about what would I think it's interesting to explain how a woman, one of the women working for you, could get out of a situation if she walked in the door. She took one look at this guy and she said, there's no way I am going to do anything with this guy. I've got to get out of here. How you did that? Uh, well, what I thought was the easiest way out was for the young lady to tell the client, gee, you know, I made them promise not to tell you, but tonight is my first night. And, you know, you really seem very nice and everything. And I just, I just, I just don't think I can go through with it. I'm awfully sorry. And then she would so leave. So pretend that she was like a, a, a... Oh, yeah, we didn't want to offend these people. There's no reason to make them feel badly. But it didn't just happen if she had just walked in the room and didn't like him. She could have been with him for two or three hours and decided she didn't like him. And if for any reason he would not pay her, uh, presumably because he hadn't had sex with mm -hmm. her, but for any reason whatsoever, if he hadn't paid her, I would pay her the full amount of money that she should have gotten. How, how uh, far would you allow the girls to go in, in the, this submission stuff, in, in bondage and discipline and the, the talking dirty and some of the other things mm -hmm. that constitute some of the reasons why men, I suppose, want to pay for sex and want to pay for this kind of companionship? Well, another thing I think a great many people don't realize is that most men prefer to be submissive. Uh, I think it's a, a huge fallacy that people think that men want to beat up women. That's just simply not so. Uh, I don't know why men like this sort of thing, but they certainly did. And uh, as far as the girls were concerned, if we knew ahead of time that a client was into this sort of thing, we would call up somebody and say, this is what, Ms., you know, this is what Mr. XYZ is into. You know, how do you feel about this? And if she said, mm, I don't think I'd feel very comfortable, we wouldn't send her. I could go along with it. Yeah. All right, now, there's, I think there's one overriding question. I want to keep going here for a second. There's one overriding important thing that I'm really wondering about. I think you present a very logical uh, discussion and argument about how you evolved into this business. You're originally on the phone with one person, and it seems like a very logical service. However, un underlying all of this, you must admit that there's an enormous stigma attached to the business you did. I mean, that's why you're sitting here on television. That's why you're arrested. Would you say that there was any sub subconscious basis of interest in how you got involved in this? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Well, what I mean is you could, there were many different kinds of businesses you could have gotten into. You were a pretty good businesswoman. Is this one just happened to be there. <laughs> it really did. It was, it was, this was a chance thing. This was a pure chance thing. And uh, that really is how it happened. What, what, what about... You said you've never got involved physically with any of the men. Mm -hmm. What was the turn on for you in this? There had to be some kind of turn on. I mean, it was a great I, job. No, it was wait, a lot of fun. Go, it was a real challenge. But going beyond that, the sex is a turn on our society. If you watch Channel J, even tonight, and you see the ads for Bel Air or whatever these Caprice, whatever these services are, there's is an allure. She advertising to, on there now. <laughs> I suppose there's an allure to all of this. What I'm curious, there must have been a turn on. There had to be. No sex way. is a turn on. But I wasn't having sex with any of these people. I mean, I had relationships with uh, three men during this time, and we had a wonderful relationship. But I mean, there must have been times when it was just great hearing. Perhaps this you're projecting, Bill. I'm projecting what anybody would would see. In I, don't th I, 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 I don't. I don't think, think the part would... I, I hear some people laughing in the back. But sure, I'm projecting. I, I mean, see, for you, it would have been a lot of fun to run an agency like this because perhaps you have a more prurient. It wasn't interest. fun for you. It was fun, but not because of that. I was never interested in what these girls did in bed with these men. I could, I felt I was, I was most explicitly not interested. You were able to approach the business of running cachet in the same way that you would run a, Any a other shoe business. store. It was a business. A, a butcher shop or yeah. anything else, just like another business. It was a business. Sure, does the guy from Seagram's drink a lot? Does the president of Phil's Mo Philip Morris smoke a lot? You know. Probably. You never know. I don't know. Anyway, that. you're going to stay with us for another segment. And the book is a very interesting one. It is called Mayflower Madam, The Secret Life of Sidney Biddle Barrows. We'll return with more right after this. <laughs> 
Welcome back. We continue with Sydney Biddle Barrows, and we're joined by two new guests. Tony Tucci, who's been with us before on Midday, the author of The Butterfly Secret, and Mileage, and they're basically two books which are just the issue of new life and also dating younger men. Uh, also, Abby Hirsch. Abby Hirsch is the founder of the Godmothers. Uh, that is a uh, dating service which is for the executive and professional men and women. She's also an author of a book called Lessons of Love. Abby, I'm curious about what you've been wondering all these years about the Mayflower Madam. Here we are on television with her. We just saw part of the interview. What are you, what, what are you curious about? Well, I want to tell you, I read the book over the weekend. I read it yesterday. And I couldn't put it down. It was funny and sexy and terrific, and it really showed you how to structure a business. And when I finished it, I was so pleased with that book. I stayed up till 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> reading it. And what I wondered was, if Sydney had stayed in business one more year, how she would have expanded. I mean, she would have had, it's not an accident that Bill Novak wrote about Lee Iacocca and then Sydney, no. because she had this business that could have been franchised. She could have just what done you say, anything Sydney? with you it. You told your father you were going to stay in business until about 1990. 1990. If, hypothetically, if you are, were still in business, where would you be now? What would you be doing? That's a very good question. I'll tell you, with, unfortunately, with the awful AIDS problem that's out there, I really don't know whether I would still be in business. No. Uh, I don't know how I would have felt you know, knowing that there was this problem out there and sending my girls. Do you think you'd have, if you were trying, is, is because of the AIDS situation now, and, and this, believe me, this is not something confined just to the homosexual community and drug abuse community. In fact, in Africa, it is a heterosexual disease. Do you think you'd have the, the same success in, in getting such a high level, at the, you know, talented, uh, relatively articulate, attractive, pulled together woman? I think it would have been much more difficult. Yeah. And I think it would have been much more difficult to uh, find the you know, number of clients that we had of that caliber also. And people are justifiably terrified of, of catching something like that. Tony, what are you wondering about this? Well, when I saw it in the paper, I uh, looked and I smiled. And, <laughs> and you know, Bill, I wrote a pro you know, fairly provocative book myself about older women and young lovers. And uh, I went through the, probably the same thing that she's going through as far as uh, what the culture is saying, you know, that this is wrong and this was terrible and everything. But I have to go back to what the doctor said to me when I was doing research. They said, we're born sexual human beings and we die sexual be human beings. No. We have this great need for love and sex till the day we die. We're born that way and we die that way. Now getting back to her service, uh, it's just it's just something that everybody has to have. It's another personal, very personal thing. I think if my husband's going to be unfaithful to me, I'd rather see him in <laughs> Sydney's uh, situation in establishment well, than, uh, you know, some other kind of terrible problem. There is one instance you write in the book of uh, an actual woman who was eight months or eight and a half months pregnant, okay. calling your service to have a, 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 a for a birthday girl, present for a birthday <laughs> present for her husband. What a generous wife! Very well. I think what Tony is saying is true. That uh, you know these men do are not looking for another relationship. They love their wives. They just want a little variety on the side. And I think that you know a woman who's secure in herself and knows her husband really loves her certainly is not going to be thrilled if her husband goes to. I don't uh, think she should know about it anyway. Uh, well, I absolutely agree with you. I think if he has any respect for her at all, he will make sure she never finds yeah. out. You That's know, the good thing about your kind of situation, is that the wife really doesn't find out. But if he, go, he goes to escort uh, services and, and little kind of things, you know, uh, somebody might see him and he, he might be found out, where yours is completely confidential. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, oh, very confidential. Except when the police sees the records. <laughs> yes. And it ceased to be confidential at that point. How does your service at Godmothers work? I mean, I, we, I guess we better draw a line of distinction between well, what cachet was and what Godmothers The line of distinction is. is that the people who come to us are the busy professional executive. And for many of them, they've been tied up at the office to the point where sex is like nostalgia. They, they can. They can remember it a they little bit. They can remember it a little bit. They can, uh, but when they hear records from the 50s, you right, know, they, they remember get aroused. It. And they come to us because they realize it may have been six months or a year before there's been anyone, since there's been anyone in their life that they have really been involved with. They mm -hmm. come to us for a totally different person, reason rather. They're trying to find one other person that they can get involved with, that they can have a relationship with. Because if they didn't want a relationship and they just wanted sex, they would call Sydney. Mm -hmm. And so we take over where she's left off, or vice versa. And when people come to us, we interview them. 
we sit down and we talk about what's worked for them in the past and what they're looking for now. And we do a very interesting interview because we're able to determine the difference between what people think they want and what they have consistently had that's either worked or not worked for them. So it's, it's kind of a formal thing. What were your interviews like? For example, when, you, when someone would call because maybe they saw the ad for Caché in the International Herald Tribune, the phone rings, you pick up the phone, all right? Mm -hmm. I'll be the man on the other end of the line. Okay. Hello, um, I read your ad in the International Herald Tribune and I'm uh, interested in finding out a little bit more about your service. Where are you staying here in Manhattan? Oh, I'm staying at the Waldorf Astoria. I see. Okay, well, let me tell you a little something about us. Let's right. see if I can remember this now. Uh, I started the agency about five years ago, and one of the cornerstones of my agency is, no, it wasn't exactly what I said, but one of the things that's most important is that I never hire anyone who does not do something else during the day. In other words, none of our girls are professional escorts. Uh, well, that, that's okay with me. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of students, some models, actresses, dancers, singers, and quite a number of young ladies, you know, in entry-level type positions who just need a little bit extra money to get by. Uh, if you'd like to take one of the young ladies to dinner, we have four hours for $500. Dinner and dancing would be six hours for $750. Or if you would just prefer to see her on an hourly basis, that would be $175 an hour. And that includes everything. There is no additional tipping involved. Uh, well, uh, what do you mean by everything? I mean, this is really the first time I've, I've ever made a call like this. And, uh, well, let's just say that really there, is no, there is no additional tipping involved. Now, if you pursue it any further, I'm going to have to hang up on you. Bill, you, you sound so experienced. <laughs> well, I am a professional interviewer, like Tony. I should be able to get through a, a, <laughs> a mock wonderful. phone call like that. Anyway. See, and then, and then we establish, then, yeah. then, uh, then you say, well, what kind of girls do you have? Or I would say to you, what type of young lady were you interested in seeing this? Right, evening? then that's what I'm trying to get. Okay, then, so then, then, then I might say, well, you know, my favorite type is I really like, uh, uh, I like oriental women. Well, see, now, unfortunately, Oriental women did not work in the quantity that we needed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I just threw that I out. I could wait I'm... forever for a pretty Oriental girl, even an ugly Oriental girl, to walk in the door. They just didn't seem to work very much. So I would mm -hmm. probably have to tell you that I was terribly sorry. I'd have to disappoint you, but I did not have any Oriental young ladies working for me. Can you give me, you give me a reference on this? No, they're very hard to find. All right. Anyway. You know, when yeah, go ahead. I first opened well, the Godmothers in 1978, one of our first male clients really wanted an Oriental girl. And we were so new that I really thought that everyone had to be, every date had to be custom created. And I sent my secretary to five Chinese restaurants to see if she could find a pretty <laughs> PhD candidate. After that, we stopped custom creating matches. Mm. You know, one of the things that is going to be dominant for the rest of the show, because Sydney's going to be leaving after this, is we've got one of the authors of a book called Remaking Love, which really analyzes uh, 20 years of the sexual revolution and its effects on women. I'd like to take a minute here and, and, and ask you to tell us a little bit about what you think the effects of the, the sexual revolution have been on men. Because I think you're rather an expert on at least some forms of, of, of uh, male sexual behavior and, 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 and what the results of this revolution have been. I think that, believe it or not, I think that the sexual revolution, actually more accurately the feminist revolution, yeah. has really incre helped to increase our business. I think that 20 years ago, men could uh, go to bed. Well, see, 20 years ago, it was difficult to get them into bed. But now that you can get them into bed, now all of a sudden you but have to please them, them, make them happy. Women. Men have to get, you know, it was difficult for men to get women in bed 20 years ago because of, you know, of their problem of getting pregnant. Now that that's not a problem anymore, it's easier for men to get women into bed. But now they have to satisfy them where they did not have to do that 20 years ago. Article upon article is being written about those multi-orgasmic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, women who, you know, you just you know, are insatiable and, you know, you as a man, you're, 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 it's on the line, you mm -hmm. know, you have to satisfy them. And that just scares the heck out of a lot of guys, especially a lot of men who are truly, you know, sexually passive. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of clients used to call us because they they wanted to have a sexual experience without having to, you know, be Mr. Macho and without having to really please this insatiable multi-orgasmic woman, woman that they were just sure was going to end up in their bed with their kind of blood. Well, also one of the things you wrote about in the book, which I think is interesting, is that the man, and Tony, I think you can identify this from the woman's viewpoint, but the man who's been in a long-term relationship, in a marriage, and all of a sudden the marriage ends, and now he's out potentially saying, hey, I want to date again, but during the time I was married, there's been this whole sexual revolution, and I really don't feel that I've got my balance. 
Yeah. And you, you write that you had many clients who really wanted to have the sexual experience just to kind of get themselves in gear. That's absolutely true. And I think one of the things that Abby said that uh, so many of these men who worked so hard, sex is just a memory, when they finally say to themselves, I just can't live without it any longer. If I have to pay for it, I will. The last thing they want to do, you know, this, this way at least they can just lie back and let somebody else take care of it. If on top of all of the other achievements that they have to, you know, work so hard yeah. at during the day, they have to go and work at picking somebody up, getting her home, and then going through the whole just, thing. I'm getting it just, tired I know just they, they just don't want to do it anymore. And also, then they have to call the next day. That's right. Because today's man knows that you really do have to call the next day and at least a postcoital postcard is an appropriate post gesture. Postcard. Or he'll feel guilty that he hasn't. This way there's no guilt, there's no, you know, he doesn't have to perform. Yeah. He can just, you know, do his thing and that's it. No responsibility. All right, we just have one minute left here and I want, again I want to show Sydney's book and Sydney can't decide what to write in it. She's <laughs> <laughs> She's already two Bill Boggs, and I, I suggest to say you were never a client, but whatever you want, I'll appreciate their... The man There's, doth protest too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like you to just, uh, in, in closing, in closing, because I think it's kind of humorous, tell the story of the, the, the room mix-up at the Waldorf Astoria. Oh, this was a very, very funny story. Uh, one night, a gentleman from the Waldorf Astoria called and asked somebody to come over to 24J. So we sent one of our young ladies over there, and she got there, and like they're supposed to do, when they get there, they call up and they say, Hi, this is Joanna, I'm here. And we write down the time so that we know exactly what time she got there. Well, about 20 minutes later, the man that we thought we'd sent her to in 24J called up and said, Gee, you know, you said she'd be here at 9 o'clock, and she's not here. And we said, Well, yes, she is. She called us to say she was here. And he said, She is not here. And we said, well, <laughs> what are we going to do about this? Well, then we started getting concerned what had happened to her. She called and said she was there. Was she down in security? Were they holding a gun to her head? What was going on? Well, fortunately, one of the girls who was in the office paying us had recently been to the Waldorf and said, you know, the J's and the T's, you know, the script, <laughs> look very on similar. <laughs> you might want to check it out. So we called up 24T, <laughs> and the man answered the phone, and we said, hello, you know, would, would, would a young lady named Joanna happen to be there? He goes, well, yes, just a moment. Would you like to speak her to We said, yes, we would. So we got her on the phone and we said, Joanna, <laughs> you are in the wrong room. And she said, no, you sent me to 24J. And I said, darling, this is 24T. She said, oh, no, what am I going to do? And so we got him on the phone and we explained to him what had happened. And he said, gee, you know, I wish you'd waited to find this out just a little bit later. <laughs> Things were progressing very nicely. <laughs> so we sent Joanna down the hall to 24T and uh, Mr. X had somebody else come over. That, what I found is kind of interesting about that story, the, the guy in the wrong room is an Englishman. Can you imagine just being in a room, somebody knocks on your door, you have no idea, you're watching TV. That's a terrific, terrific story. A lot of good stories in the book. It it's is better than candy manner. from the hotel manager. <laughs> it's better than that mint on your pillow before right. you go. Or flour right. from a fruit basket. We'll be back to continue right after this. Thank you. All right, about 20 years ago, or slightly more, women who were dissatisfied with their sex lives pretty much blamed themselves, and men blamed women as well. Indeed, research from that period showed that actually more than 50% of American women were frigid. But by 1975, a Red Book survey found that 81% of the respondents had orgasms all or most of the time. So the question is, what has changed? Well, that is examined in this book, which is certainly an interesting study written by three authors. It's called Remaking Love. One of those authors, Gloria Jacobs, is with us right now. It's good to Hi. have you here. Thank you for coming. Also joining our panel is uh, Karen O'Neill, who is the Classified Advertising Manager of New York Magazine, and you run a lot of those personal... Strictly. Strictly <laughs> personal ads. Uh, let, let's all, and, and, and Tony is here and, and Abby as well, let, let, let's begin by concentrating on, on some of the, the, the thesis of remaking love, if we can, okay? Mm -hmm. When I say what has changed, basically the book says two things have changed. Women have changed and that the nature of, of sex has changed. Well, basically what we're arguing is that when people talk about the sexual revolution, nothing really changed for men. Men have always had access to sex, they've never been expected to be virgins, they've always right. had the freedom to have sex wherever they wanted it. Within and, and in fact, without. we're encouraged to be sexual and to pursue right. sex. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, that's no sexual revolution. No. But in fact, what happened, and no one ever kind of looked at and said is, wow, women transformed their lives in a very, very short period. Not only the idea that they went from being mostly frigid to hardly frigid at all, they went from being almost mostly virgins to hardly any at all as well. And that has to 
change your attitude about yourself in a lot of Don't ways. Don't you think a lot of that had to do because we were also isolated wives and mothers? And we weren't really in the workforce, and now we're in the workforce. Absolutely. And uh, uh, we finally realized that we're we're missing something. And you know what's happened? We have uh, every uh, three marriages, every two marriages out of three, is divorce. So we had a big problem. What was happening? Where were we failing? We're all divorced. I mean, I'm talking well, about the majority. I don't think it's failure, though, necessarily. It's not so much seeing it as failure as seeing that women now were able to make demands about what they but wanted. But we looked at it as failure. And what I think happened? we did at one point, yes. and then these are part of the changes, too. Women don't feel that it's a failure to have had lots of affairs anymore, or they don't feel it's a failure to have had a divorce because they have lots of other things that are exciting in their lives. One of the things that I think is interesting about the book is, as, as you read it, you see the, the sense of the, that the sexual freedom is something that women deeply wanted, but at the same time deeply feared. Well, first of all, we were taught to fear yeah. it. You know, there's I mean, that's, it's a tremendous contradiction. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's why some of the backlash we're seeing now is part of that contradiction, that it's very hard for women to live up to the expectations of sexual liberation if you've been trained one way, and I think it's even harder for men. I think it's very, very hard for men, what Sidney Barrows was talking about. It's hard for men to think about having to perform for women when women always performed for them, mm -hmm. and they're feeling very don't ambivalent. Don't you think that we're, we're really having to deal with the honesty part of this, that uh, we really do enjoy going to bed at times and we uh, that is as much a part of our life as uh, taking care of children and, and cleaning the carpets. I see well, something else with yeah. the godmothers though. I see a couple of things. I see women who talk to us about past relationships and and they're they're confused and they're a little unhappy because while they have been sexually satisfying, the commitment isn't there. And in the end, they really are looking for commitment. When women are still looking for commitment in between times that they choose to play around. And hmm. one of the code words yeah. that men use when they describe the sort of woman they would like to find through us is they say, she should not be too assertive. And I think that what they are saying is that they are now feeling that women are coming on to them in a way that is making them feel acutely uncomfortable yes. because since they have to, because of good manners, form at least a semblance of a relationship if they have sex with somebody now, that one of the changes with women feeling a certain freedom or at least verbalizing a certain freedom is that men have, have withdrawn from that. And I think that everyone has to perhaps re-examine what's going to get them what they want. If what they want is sex, that's one thing. If what they want is relationships, well, that there's a certain area of, if not tiptoeing, a certain reticence that everyone could well think about and redefine their behavior in terms of. One of the things we say in the book is that men traditionally have always felt that the women in their lives handled emotions and feelings and they could go to women for emotions and that now even if they just wanted a one night stand they expected a woman to feel strongly about that one night stand and when she doesn't they don't have access to those kind of feelings because they weren't necessarily raised Right. to feel that kind of love. Right. And so commitment. everyone is feeling so. somewhat left out yeah. in a new arrangement, which is also, I think, a lot of play acting. Because under the new arrangement, where people are not supposed to say things like, uh, well, this has been nice, and what about tomorrow night? You know, <laughs> I, I want to I interject something here. I've, I've been interviewing people on, on this subject for, for quite a while. And I honestly think that pretty much what we said is something we could have said in 1980 or 1981 or 1982. And I'm not mm. putting down the, the premise of the book. Yeah. But I want to throw a blanket on this, almost like this is a good, strong, smoldering social fire. And the blanket I want to throw over it is the fear of AIDS. I honestly believe that the kind of conversation we're having in a little while is really going to be obsolete. I think that people's personal choices are being enormously changed because of the fear of catching something that's going to kill them. Now, if you think I'm and wrong, I don't, me. I don't yeah, agree I with you. Agree. I don't agree because if, we, let's say, last year we probably did 1,500 interviews with new people. If I say to you that we did not hear the word AIDS or herpes that was last more than year. two or three times. No, but I'm, I'm talking about year. in the last year. We're coming oh, up to right year. now, Excuse within me. the last year. And I think that in certain peer and professional groups who do not know people who have died from AIDS and no. who still assume that it is mainly a homosexual right. disease, that it is not in the forefront of their mind as it is in the forefront of the press. For yeah. 
for reasons that are either good or bad, it may be by next year as the heterosexual and infant mm -hmm. studies come out. But I don't agree that that is something that your average professional executive I mean, I, man I or woman think about a lot. I haven't conducted any surveys, oh, but just from, I, just from I, the I, people I, I agree just with from the people I talk no, to, I, I I, I've, I've, spoke, I've spoken to people uh, extensively about it. I just got back from California. It just seems to be it's on like everyone's dead out there at night. on everyone's <laughs> mind. I've talked. I've talked to guys who normally would be, you know, still treading the same trails yeah. through the singles bars, but who just aren't doing. I think it. people are not going to give up sex. Yeah, they just aren't. No, and the no, fact you know, is, they'll readjust. They'll readjust. But the fact is, the person you're monogamous with this year, if they weren't monogamous last year. Who knows what's going to happen anyway? But the question is, what were they doing two or three years ago? Well, exactly. Ago? So it's too late. So you might as well have sex yes, but and how think about, about the safe sex. Goes on there is probably, but then the you have to. Though. You either have to do safe sex or you have to stop. And I, I think there's still a notion if you meet somebody in a respectable way that they're going to be a peer, and peers are not going to have AIDS. Oh, I don't I think, think that's that why means the classified respectable way. Has, is growing. I really do. I don't ever hear the word AIDS. But I hear the fear in, sort of symbolically in the copy. It's uh, it, both for men and women. Very few of the advertisers really say that they are open to uh, women. Of course, we don't allow the word women in it. He must be looking for a woman, you know. But uh, I, I see it just in the numbers. We get 10,000 pieces of mail a week on an average week. And that number is growing, and it's all people looking for relationships, but why serious is that ones. Safer? Why is it safer to find it through classified? Well, safer in the sense of AIDS. Yeah. Well, just the selective yeah. attitudes in the I copy. I get the feeling they've left the single very, bars and gone into oh, personal relationships. No question. Really no no different, question. It's, it's well, except that you uh, it, you cut the amount of time down, yeah. and uh, <laughs> you're very you're assured that the person is coming. Uh, from the same background that you are or what you would like to date. And uh, uh, I see um, AIDS as being a, a real fear, and it will probably show in the next 10, 12 months even more so. Yeah, that's the, f mm. the feeling I get yeah. is that, that we're at the beginning of a trend that, uh, of, will, of yeah, real, with real, real withdrawal mm -hmm. and, and paranoia yes. about mm -hmm. people's pasts mm -hmm. and, and sexual about partners. Casual sex. And even yes. potentially getting to the point in casual sex. And pr actually, what I'm talking about, I think promiscuity is that's really right. being greatly yeah. diminished as yeah. a result. It's not sex yeah. as much as, well, as, again, if we were talking in 1980, six years ago, that's, the, uh, that's not even, <laughs> what is it? It's not half a decade. Right. We would be talking about a relatively yeah. promiscuous society yeah. where, where uh, New York Magazine, Ms. Magazine, whatever, people were writing about having sex frequently on the first date, the concept. I remember Gail Green was probably hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> but it was writing about, you know, what, what right. constitutes a good evening. Well, you go out to dinner and have sex. That's it, you know? But I don't think that that is exactly what people are thinking about anymore. No. Well, but it started even before the fear of AIDS that there became a cultural change well, there was where people for were while. looking for relationships and they were looking for them for a number of reasons one because relationships became a popular thing again and men's in when i opened the godmothers in 78 one of the reasons i opened it is because men were saying they wanted to fall in love and so it was no longer that wedlock and bear trap were the same words to them so I think it goes back, and so once you have a fear of AIDS, if you have a fear of AIDS, but you also before that have all of the psychoanalytic things that people have looked into, and the psychotherapy, and that is all geared to separating the concept between sex and love. And so I think it was in the wind anyhow, and certainly if there is a fear, of disease out there. It all blends right in to make people feel conservative. In Washington, when they everyone was losing jobs, everyone wanted to get married. Yeah. And it was the I economics like of desire, a, as I like call it. Like nature is, is slowing us down, like That's nature true. does, you know, kills off so many thousands of millions of Indians with flood because of famine and everything. And I think we've been so promiscuous and That's been true. such a society of loose morals that I think nature is, the force of nature well, is saying something certainly we hear that you hear that coming up in the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. And just to shift a second, another thing I found interesting about the book was yeah. how, the, uh, how the, the sexual revolution, in your view, and theoretically, has been, been kind of co-opted by the the Bible. Right, Why don't you right. just tell us a little bit about that? Well, basically what we found, and I have to say it started in New York. I went into one of the Christian bookstores just to see what they were writing about sex, and there were more shelves than in, than in the B. Dalton. You know, it was really very well covered, so I thought, uh-huh, you know, <laughs> here's something. And really what I think happened is that as 
the women's revolution spread and as women became more demanding, there were little murmurs in the Christian right saying, you know, from the women saying, we want more too and we need more. And one of the safest outlets for one reason or another was in sexuality, um, that women could express themselves more sexually without tipping the boat too much, shall we say. And Maribel Morgan with, right. you know, all of her crazy costumes was the forerunner of that. But uh, and you have to forgive me on this because I, o I only ask this because I am de I'm really curious. I have personally not seen a lot of evidence of this. P give us some examples of, uh, uh, other than the of books the book? on the shelves. Uh, 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 of specific indications that... Well, I mean, you're not going to see specific no. indications. They're not making X-rated films in the bedrooms. But you can see... In the bedrooms, in the see bedrooms, bedrooms of married people is what you're talking yes, about. Yes. It's yeah. married couples predominantly. You have someone like Tim and Beverly LaHaye. He's been on the board of the Moral Majority. He's a big lobbyist in Washington. He and his wife wrote a book about marriage and sex where they give explicit detail. It's straight out of Our Bodies Ourselves or anything like that. And... Um, basically, they say as women ought to have good sex, men have to please women now. You know, they're really taking a very feminist line, right. and you know it's having some impact because it's selling in the millions. Why don't we take a break and we come back? I think we'll try to end the show by talking about two of the myths that you try to explode here. One is that the sexual revolution is over, and the other is that women are glad that it's over. Mm -hmm. We'll be back to talk about that and more right after this. Right, right. All right, welcome back. Uh, the book that is inspiring what we're talking about, uh, the latter part of the show, is called Remaking Love. The authors are Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, Elizabeth Hess, and Gloria Jacobs, who's, who's with us right now. Uh, you, you maintain in the, in the book that the sexual revolution hasn't ended. That's a myth, you say. People right. say it has. And the other myth is that women are glad that it's ended. So again, I ask you to expound on your theories here. Right, it's not and we're not. Um, Basically, what we're saying is that the sexual revolution is in many places, for one thing, and it is in the marriage bedroom, and there are things going on, these Tupperware-style sex parties. Um, there's a whole lot of ways in which m women are participating in sexuality mm -hmm. that they never did before. Let me interrupt to ask a yeah. question. Um, I'm sure, theoretically, you're against hardcore pornography, but is there a part of you that might uh, embrace the fact that there may be couples watching hardcore pornography? Absolutely, and don't assume I'm <laughs> against it. You know, my motto in my life has always been, don't assume anything, <laughs> right. so I shouldn't have assumed that. Huh? No, I think that's part of it. I think women have learned to enjoy Old all videos. sorts of, yeah. more as many women rent yeah. them as men, apparently, See, the latest statistics. I believe Absolutely. in couples uh, enjoying uh, sexy movies together and the fantasies. Uh, making love with uh, Gregory Peck, and you're probably making love with Raquel Welch. <laughs> I think that's also wonderful and stimulating. I, I don't think that's that. the hard porn that they're talking about. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, but uh, ba basically what you're saying is that the, the, what I was maintaining is that the, an area that is generally really shot down by feminists on, on one level may be, in fact, pretty much uh, an feminists, active part yeah. of the sexual revolution. Yeah. I think we're saying the sexual revolution is about choice, about women ha having the choice to have sex when and where they want, with whom, in whatever manner, instead of being frigid in bed with a man, you know, that is the only man they've ever d experienced in their whole life. How much progress is being made in the reversal of the stereotype that it's okay for an older man to be involved with a younger woman, but it certainly seems weird when a younger man gets involved with an older woman. If you see a 25-year-old man dating a 50-year-old woman, it does not happen very often, but you either think maybe the 25-year-old man is gay or maybe the kid, the 25-year-old guy is out for her money or something <laughs> like that. One does not necessarily make the first assumption, uh, and maybe not always the second assumption when it's a younger woman, older man. And you have a lot of thoughts about this, I know. Too. Well, uh, not only a lot of thoughts, but yeah. <laughs> that's the kind of a life I've been living. Thank God in Butterfly Secret, which was written seven years ago, I mean, on every page, though I tell older women that uh, you better get your hair done uh, to go out, not to sit home and watch the television. And the only people that are going to go out with an older woman in our society today is probably a younger man, because he's done the whole yeah. sexual revolution. Yeah. He's not into the Playboy Bunny. Yeah. He knows that women are supposed to have sex and they're supposed to have an orgasm they're supposed to come and he he likes that and he's into a woman's sexuality and he's just left his mother's house so he's a good combination <laughs> for the older woman you know to be yeah. cuddled and loved 
and uh, so I think uh, I don't think it's stereotype, Bill. I think uh, I, I think, think you're finding rare. a lot of these relationships today. I, I think it's rare. I think it. I think that there is still a, a stigma attached. There is, a, and a big one. A no, big I think it's less. Attached. I think it's less. I don't see. You know, again, at the Godmothers, when men ask for women, they want a younger woman. That's right. Positively. And, and but... so I think that probably what happens is, should they meet an older woman on their own, that may be different. But when they are conceptualizing the sort of relationships they want, they do not deliberately say, please find me an older woman. They don't, not only that, they, they make a point of not finding you. Well, I mean, uh, well, I, what I try to do is to educate the, the mass, uh, my, uh, we're the greatest majority. We're, we're out there, you know. I'm trying to say to them, listen, it's better to go out with a boy who's in the gasoline station who wants to take you out than to sit home. Get out. You might get a chance to meet a man who's more your contemporary who finally say, oh, boy, you look pretty good. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, that, that kind of thing. Get out. And see if he has a father who's a fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the funniest part. Every father I've ever met wanted the younger woman, and every the son has always thought I was the most attractive. That guy at the gas station may you know, take, take some license numbers of Mercedes that, yeah, yeah. that pull through. Well, what, what's your general feeling uh, well, about Well, I was this? thinking about that recently and realized that of a very close circle of friends, a huge number of the women I know are either married to or living with guys 10 to 11 years younger than Absolutely. them. Absolutely. So it's either the cutting edge or, you know, I think it's just the women's sexual revolution continuing. Women know they can go anywhere for men as well. Mm -hmm. I think the stereotype will change. But isn't it also that women, again, women and men looking for relationships? Because some years sure. ago, women would say, look, if it can't be an age that I think is appropriate, I'm not going to do it. And now, since we're back to relationships, there are more accommodations that are made also. I think that's I true. Think, yeah. yeah, I think that's all part of it. I think marriage is definitely in. I think it's in for all kinds of relationships, so the older woman and the younger lover and the older yeah. man, and we're accepting that, and we know every rich, it's beautiful, older man in the world from Hayakoka down is marrying a much 30-year-old women, you know, compared to their ages. And I think we're beginning to be honest with each other. I, I kind of like the feeling of what's happening to us, Bill. I think we're just looking at each other in the eye and feeling each other's pain mm -hmm. and what we want and what we desire. I think we're do going through a good time. I see good, I see, see we, good things. We I don't say see that here, things. but I wonder if Iacocca ran for president, what sort of detriment his marrying that much younger a woman might be to the world that's out there. We are, after all, in New York. But and that, again, is the stereotype, the older yes. man with the younger woman. That's not the new culture anyway, so it's... Yeah, it'd be interesting if Iacocca married a, a woman 15 years old, and they yeah. would have been married well, a 75-year-old. Right. You know, I don't know. We're out of time. I wish we weren't, because I've particularly enjoyed the show. Uh, Ms. Magazine, Can Man Have It All? See, I still haven't been able to figure out. I better read this very, 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 very quickly. And this is your anniversary year, right? Yeah, We're looking forward to doing years. something else with you that year. And Tony Tucci's book, uh, Butterfly Secret, you know about this is another book of hers, which is called Mileage. And this is Remaking Love. And I, want to I don't have New York Magazine. Um, let's see. Visualize it. <laughs> New York Magazine. <laughs> Thank you for Thank being you. here. Uh, tomorrow we're doing a back to school special. Victor will be back with one of his spots. We're going to be talking about homeless students who are still A students. Howard Hurwitz, PhD, will be here. We have uh, leaders of readers, an ex-con who came back uh, from prison to graduate from high school and go to college. Students with unusual skills. So take it easy, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.